Welcome to The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us once again. Now, I really want to explore today part of the postal crisis we're facing in the United States today. And to understand this crisis the nation's facing at this moment, we have to go back to the roots of labor militancy back in 1970, when there was a wildcat postal strike that led to increased wages and benefits, but also opened the Pandora's box of privatization, which led to Federal Express and other mail delivery companies being born. While the strike was successful, Richard Nixon got a law passed that said the agency would have to raise its own funds for the sale of products, postage, and more. So this crisis we face now has its roots in a 50-year-old labor struggle and a 50-year slow death in diminution of the post office. To walk us through that history and bring us to the moment we're in now, we're joined by Paul Prescott, who is a union activist, member of the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers, a teacher himself, and a contributing editor to Jackman Magazine, where he wrote the article, When the Mailman Rebelled. And Paul, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be here. So, so take us back to 1970 and what happened then. I mean, maybe in terms of our ages and generations, I probably could take you back there first. But right. <laughs> in terms of your history and your, and your study, tell, tell us what went on in 1970, this wildcat strike, the change in nature of the post office, and in many ways did begin with, with the roots of where we are now. Yeah, sure. And definitely fill me in on gaps, you know, um, <laughs> that I miss. Um, but, you know, so postal workers, they, um, for this had been building for a while. So this was what seemed like a very spontaneous strike, but the conditions have been building for a long time. So generally, they were kind of treated worse than other public workers, government workers, civil servants, you know, they made a lot less than sanitation workers, police officers, firefighters. Um, and based on the law, they weren't allowed to strike. So a lot of postal workers called it, you know, they had collective begging, not collective bargaining. Um, and they described a lot of the mail rooms they worked in as dungeons, you know, overheated, no ventilation, no air, no windows, things like that. So it had been building for a long time. Um, and in 1969, at a uh, uh, postal workers union branch in the Bronx, um, a few workers went on a sick out. So they called in sick um, a as a protest action. And this really caught fire in a way people didn't really expect. Um, and workers started on their own mobilizing to um, get those same workers uh, reinstated and not be fired for what they did. Um, and it really took off and it kind of showed there was a lot of anger boiling beneath the surface. Um, and this kind of boiled over into this uh, big union meeting in New York City. It was the largest uh, meeting that they ever had in that Postal Workers Union local. There were some rank and file activists who were gaining prestige in the local, and they basically led a strike vote that um, passed by somewhat of, of a thin margin. Um, and from there, the leadership of the unions were not really in control of this. Uh, so it kind of spread like wildfire. And all of a sudden, you had this national postal worker strike that no one saw coming. The union leaders didn't necessarily sanction it. Um, and so things kind of seemed out of control uh, from that point. But they were really striking to catch up to what they saw, uh, the gains that other government employees were making during that time. And I, you know, this also, let's think about the moment we were in then and, and, and why this might have been happening as well. I mean, you had, there were probably the, some of the lowest paid federal workers were among the postal workers back in that day. We can talk a bit about that. And how many of the, the, the workers were people of color, Latinos in the Southwest and black workers, especially in urban areas in the West and the East. And the, 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 the Panthers and Black Power was, was rolling and the, the Vietnam War was happening. A lot of the people working there were Vietnam War vets. Um, so there was, this, there was a lot there that kind of made this boil over. So, right. he, he, and so the, the, can think about that moment and talk a bit about that from your perspective historically in your studies, but also think about what that means for right this moment. Yeah, it, and it's interesting because even a lot of average rank and file workers, they didn't consider themselves, themselves radicals. They talked about this climate of dissent. So this is a point where the Vietnam War is very unpopular. And it's not just unpopular, but even it's now becoming mainstream to oppose the Vietnam War. It's not just students on campus. You've had the civil rights movement going for many years, the black power movement. In general, a lot of workers just, you know, describe that people just questioned authority in general throughout society. And so you had Vietnam War veterans, whether they're black or white, going to the war, you know, they expect to be treated well and they come back to this crappy job with crappy pay. So they're they're angry about that. Many black people who have been involved in the civil rights struggle. And it's sort of like taking this uh, militancy that was existing outside the labor movement and bringing it inside the labor movement um, and, and really starting to question authority in many ways. And, you know, I, I, 
don't think you can draw direct parallels, but it's sort of an interesting moment now where you've had so many people, especially younger people, excited by the Bernie Sanders campaign in this moment we're living in. A lot of these people do not, at least yet, have a connection with the labor movement. So it will be interesting to see if, you know, they kind of bring these more, um, I wouldn't even call them radical, but America's context, radical politics into the workplace as like a site of struggle. Well, I, and I think about that. I mean, the, 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 the postal workers are, are, are union members. Um, they're, they're, they, they're, they're clearly, they're, they're trying to complete the dismantling of the post office that began in 1970 at the end of the strike. Um, so let me start there and then come right. back to what I said first. I mean, so how do you make this connection between what happened at that moment? You have this situation in 1970, the wildcat strike across the country. Uh, workers slowing down, walking out of their jobs, eight days, right? Am I right about that? Right. Mm -hmm. right? Eight days in March and 1970. And, and so, and, 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 they, and, and, and they sent federal troops to New York, as you, and you can talk a bit about that. You wrote right. about that. But what do you think happened politically where the this, where this workers struck, got what they wanted in a wildcat strike, which is, doesn't always happen because those strikes are, quote unquote, illegal, and then Nixon and company and the Republicans in charge and Democrats as well in 1970 turned on the workers and, and started dismantling this and creating this privatized agency. Um, so did, talk about that dynamic. Yeah. And just to pick off, pick up first about the um, federal troops being sent in, just to yeah. get an idea of how dramatic the situation got. So Nixon calls in the National Guard to, to move the mail. And there's a lot of freaking out about what this means for just discipline in general. So, you know, federal workers are supposed to be more docile. You know, you're not supposed to really question authority because you work for authority. Um, and, you know, Time magazine said, you know, this could really set a bad president if you have federal workers define the law like this. What is this going to mean for our society? So, you know, Nixon calls in the National Guard. Um, they have, it turns out, you know, moving the mail is actually hard. There are skills, you know, uh, associated with it. So, you know, they did terribly at moving the mail. There were actually some reports of um, some postal workers who were in the National Guard actually deliberately sabotaging the process to help out postal workers. Um, you know, and it's so it is pretty dramatic. Um, you know, you think about revolutions when they get serious, that's when the military starts turning on authority. So, Maybe it wasn't quite that dramatic, but you have the National Guard also kind of defying, defying orders in that sense. Um, so the, the strike ended up, it was an overwhelming victory. So the postal workers got um, uh, big pay raises. They were also able to, you know, maximize the salary where they would max out. They got really good um, health benefits. They also got more structured collective bargaining um, that allowed them to actually bargain and not beg in the future. Um, but the other side of that, which you mentioned, is the um, Postal Reorganization Act. Um, and that set it up in a different way. There were some gains and some downsides to it. So they set it up to be less political where, you know, the Postmaster General is just directly appointed um, by whichever party is coming in power. Um, they also set it up, like you said, the uh, post office had to now be self-sufficient funding. So a lot of people still don't know this, but the post office does not take taxpayer dollars. Um, now, I will say the post office actually did not have much of a problem uh, being self-sufficient financially. Um, so I, my take on this, and there might be, you know, when you interview others in the union, they might have a different take. Uh, I think the push for privatization was going to come either way. I think, especially once the 80s really got going, that's where you see the attack on labor, the attack on the left, and privatization in all kinds of industries. Um, you can even actually date it back to uh, President Carter, he actually started a lot of this deregulation. So I don't think it was totally because of that reorganization that caused the privatization. I think that was coming anyway because they, they just wanted to privatize everything in the public sector. Um, the real problems came with funding is in 2006, some people might know about, um, there was a bipartisan bill Congress passed called the um, uh, Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. And that's where they forced the post office to pre-fund pensions and health benefits 75 years in advance. And literally no other government agency, no other private corporation has to do this. So before that, you know, they were basically breaking even or running a surplus. Ever since that moment, they've been, um, you know, in a deficit. 
And it's just been getting worse and worse because each year, billions of dollars they have to set aside. Um, and when COVID hit, it's hit everyone hard economically and the postal service is no different. Um, so they were already in this weak position because of that law. And that was just now being accelerated by what's been happening with the economic crisis. So one of the things here that's interesting that you that made me think of as you were describing what happened over the, over the decades um, and culminated in 2006 is that what we're facing now with COVID, what we're facing now with this, this um, the, the vote by mail, Right. Uh, and and the and the Trump's attacks on that and his allies' attacks on the post office and on, on on voting by mail. This is also this is also attack on the working class, right? The working class who work in the post office. Um, and you know, you see most polls say that ninety percent of Americans are happy with the post office. Yep. So th- 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 there's a confluence of events here that don't parallel 1970, but clearly have for me have their roots there. But talk about what you, what you see now. I mean, you've been involved as a, as a labor activist. You know, a lot of folks were involved in the postal struggle as well. So, 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 so can you make those connections for us? Yeah. And, um, and it's kind of an interesting moment. I, you know, I'm really glad that all of a sudden the Postal Service is in the news. It's like all the rage now. But generally, you know, from MSNBC, CNN, they're coming at this from the angle of the election. And of course, that's important to protect, you know, our, our voting rights. But, you know, I think even more importantly is Postal Service as a working class institution. So and, and this goes to show why they want to privatize it. And, you know, the joys move to uh, delay mail. It's not just about the election. I think they also were doing this as, as one more step to undermine it and privatize it. So, you know, the Postal Service is home to over 600,000 living wage jobs. Um, the average salary is uh, 55000 a year. So obviously, postal workers aren't living large. It's not like a worker's utopia. But in, in the United States in 2020, it is harder and harder to come by good, solid union jobs, you know, with good benefits and stability. So that's a big reason why they want to attack it. And it's you can think of it as a form of, of union busting. Um, and also, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about particularly for black workers historically and today. Postal Service has been a very crucial um, institution for upward mobility. Um, I mean, this goes all the way back to the, to the 1940s, um, and it's continued all the way till today. 21% of postal workers are black, so they're disproportionately represented in the postal workforce. And again, I mean, there's been a crisis in jobs for everyone, but especially black workers, a lot of them, public sector jobs are like the very thin line between some kind of stability and being impoverished. So. It doesn't seem like it's a racial justice struggle, but I, I think people should recognize, you know, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we can hold police accountable, you know, we could defund the police, but if at the same time the postal service is privatized and these jobs are destroyed, that's going to be a disaster, especially for black workers who have gotten so much out of this institution over the long term. So as somebody who thinks deeply about the history of, of labor and is also a labor activist, um, in your own union, and have this sense of solidarity with the postal workers. I mean, where do you think this struggle is going to go, and how do you think that how do you think labor solidarity fits into all of this, um, and, and what we may, we may not be aware of that's unfolding? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good, you know, the old slogan from labor: "Injury to one is an injury to all." You know. Many people in the labor movement don't take that as seriously as they should, but I think we're at an interesting moment where, again, the public is like overwhelmingly on the side of the Postal Service. It's a good flashpoint to unite around. So I think, you know, in, in, in Philly, we've been working with the Postal Workers Union. Um, these unions should like see this as a fight they need to double down on because it's also about saving the public sector more generally. If they can privatize this, you know they're going to go to the next thing. Um, and I also think this is an opportunity for after this crisis, hopefully where we do save the Postal Service and you're even seeing, you know, centrist Democrats are now coming out, at least for the time period of, of now to save the Postal Service. Let's think about the future. So the Postal Workers Union has talked about postal banking. Um, and this is a demand that Bernie Sanders uh, lifted up. I mean, that's the only reason I, I first heard about it. And that's to offer basic banking services in the post office. Um, we used to have it in this country. Many other countries do it. And it would be a big 
uh, attack on the payday loan um, industry. And again, I think you can look at this through a lens of racial justice. I think you see these, basically these loan sharks are most active in working class communities of color. Um, and this would be a win for everyone. So not only do you provide good banking um, options for working people, you would create more employment in the post office, so more good living wage jobs. It's also a way of increasing revenue for the postal service. Um, so I think people should be thinking about after this crisis, you know, labor and community allies uniting around the postal service, not just to save it, not just to repeal that 2006 law, which absolutely needs to happen, but how can we expand the postal service? You know, postal banking. People have talked about having electric car charging stations at post offices. People have talked about uh, internet as an internet hub for communities that don't have as much internet access. You know, we should be thinking bigger. Of course, you know, this is going to take funding and uh, it's going to be a political struggle. But I think we've seen in this moment that the public is actually on our side on this. And I think there's a lot of material to work with in terms of mobilizing people around this public service. So to conclude, I mean, I think that what you're raising here is a really important issue for us to wrestle with in the coming months um, around this struggle. I mean, it, it because it, it seems to be, a, there's this confluence of events happening. The fight for the future of democracy, the right of uh, us to, to, to vote by mail, uh, and, and, and the, the danger of the right kind of trying to seize that. A working class organization with a huge uh, plurality of, of uh, workers of color uh, in it, in the, postal, in the postal workers, so that's in issues of race, and then thinking about what 21st century postal service should be, that could also, is also a threat to some private companies like Federal Express, like the big internet companies, Comcast and the rest, because it could change the, na it could change the nature of what we think the public sector should do in terms of being the highway for America that allows things to build around it. I mean, that's, you know, I think, I think there, there's a lot of tentacles to this that we're not considering. Yeah, it, it, it's a perfect example of why it touches on so many different struggles at the same time. And also, you know, we need to look at what can unite the broadest possible of people. And it's it's kind of cliche, but I've been very disturbed at the culture wars, which I mean, to be fair, right wing and left wing drum up. But the right wing is very skilled at uh, creating a culture war to divide us. And the post service is a good example of an institution that. 91% support, that's urban, that's rural, Republican, Democrat, independent. Um, it's, it's something that we, you know, we really can unite around. Right, and the whole idea of public banking, which would unite rural as well as urban, suburban, that whole, that whole idea um, was put forth before, and, this, and I, if it gets raised in the proper way, this could actually heighten uh, the, the, the kind of consciousness and pull some of the, the elements of the white working class back into right. the struggle with everybody else. Yeah, and just one thing to keep in mind, you know, we need to be vigilant. So what DeJoy has said is that he's gonna stop mail delays until the election's over. So, and again, these delays are basically a ploy to privatize. So I work in public education, this happens all the time. You, you take away funding and support, the schools start not doing so well, and then you turn around and say, oh, well, looks like we need charter schools, we need to privatize. So, you know, Right after the, the election, this fight will be live. And also, we should be aware that, you know, Democrats, many of them are probably fine with privatizing the postal service as well. Um, you know, I, I do think Trump is um, definitely worse than what Biden would be. But I can easily see the uh, Pete Buttigieg's of the world in, um, I don't know, 2028 being totally fine with privatizing it. Um, so we should be clear that, you know, the only thing that will get it, get us out of this is building a broad movement. Um, there's not many allies we can really rely on in Congress besides someone like Bernie, but he's unfortunately pretty unique in our political system. Well, well Paul Prescott, this has been really interesting, for, and I, I appreciate you taking the time today, and it's uh, good to have you with us. Paul Prescott, of course, as we said earlier, is a union activist, writes for Jackman Magazine, uh, and you'll be seeing more of him in Real News as we dive into labor and the future of the struggle here in America. And Paul, thanks for your work, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. And we'll be covering this post office issue in depth over the next coming weeks. Uh, and uh, Paul and others will be back. Please uh, let us know what you think and give us your ideas. And I'm Mark Steiner here, the Real News Network. Thank you for joining us. Take care. <laughs>